Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. How are you? Yeah. Woo! This is so cool. I am so excited to be here, and I'm so excited to see so many people. I'm about to throw up. Um, one of the first things is, uh, where's Russ Holler? Russ, will you stand up, please? Thank you. Russ was voted uh, most likely to show up late by the journalism school seniors, and so I, I bow to you, sir, for managing to make it here on time. Thank you. <laughs> and I appreciate you all being here because I know for seniors this is LDOC, because as seniors you know uh, how to get out of a Friday class, right? <laughs> I would hope that by now. Uh, so I am so appreciative that you're here uh, instead of at the library or Pantana Bob's or, you know, wherever. Um, because I got to tell you, uh, skipping and or postponing your, your bar crawling, you know, I wouldn't want to do that if I had to listen to me. <laughs> so I'm really appreciative that you actually decided that you would take the time and be, be here with me instead. So seniors do rule. There is no doubt in my mind about that. Um, I don't know why we were only fifth but we are uh, among the happiest universities uh, in the nation. And one of the things I thought was most impressive is the score we got for, I would do it all over again. So how many of you, now that you are getting ready to blow this pop stand, would do it all over again? Yeah! Parts of it, okay. I'm, I'm good with that. So um, I did want to take one moment to uh, just be serious for like a teensy second here. There was a time not that long ago that I was afraid I was going to be giving my last lecture. I was diagnosed with cancer in July 2011. And it was a, a brutal period of time. But by the grace of God, I stand before you um, and I have been two years out of treatment and I am in a category they call no evidence of disease. So. <laughs> I have, thank you, I have a wonderful medical team here at UNC. Uh, they gave me a choice between here and Duke. Yeah. <laughs> Let me think. Um, but in addition to that, I had all of you. And that's all of you who I know and all of you who I may have seen at some time around campus. I made a big effort, even though there were many days I felt like crap. Can I say that? Um, that I wanted to be here because I got energy and I got support from you. People I knew, students in my classes who would uh, bring silly hats for me to wear uh, when I had no hair. And um, we would take a lot of pictures of these really bad hats. And I thank you all for making me look like an idiot. Um, and I had faculty and, and staff friends who would go with me and sit, and sit while I had chemo. Uh, I think a lot of it was because they got out of faculty meeting. <laughs> I'd like to think otherwise, but you know, that's how it is. So I thank all of you that I am able to be here to give you your last lecture, not mine. An end of the serious stuff. I brought the diet sun kissed. Because uh, that's what I, all my hands are full. So this was just in honor of, why is it you always do it to the screen when it's really over here? This was, uh, I had a party and, and noticed that it is we kicked cancer's butt. And that was really the big issue for me. All right, so who's got a job? Yeah, all right, so where, where are those hands? Who's got a job? Where do you have a job at? I'll be teaching in public schools with Teach for America Baltimore Corps. Sweet. Who else? Somebody else. Who's got a job? Um, Haynes Brands. Excellent. Where are you going to be? Winston-Salem. Winston-Salem. All right. Can we get like samples or something? <laughs> Who else got a job? I'll be a lab tech at Lineberger Cancer Center. Nice, you are my hero. <laughs> Back here, who's got a job? 
I'm going, going to be, be a legislative assistant in uh, DC. Whoa, <laughs> flapping. <laughs> this is cool stuff. One more, who's got a job? Hang on, we have to go over here. And his <laughs> mic is gone. I went too far, probably. You, where will you be? I'll be at the American Spectator in Washington, D.C. American, American Spectator in Washington, D.C. Nice. Who's, Who's going, going to grad school? Hi. Where are you going? Hi. Rachel. <laughs> Woo! Social, Social work, work, right? Yes. Excellent. Who else? I'll be going to Johns Hopkins. Nice. <laughs> Where are you going at? I'm staying in Chapel Hill. Yes! <laughs> Woo! This is so cool. I commend you. I'm listening to myself echo. It's very odd. That's part of what it's about, right? Is ultimately getting that job or going to graduate school, or going back home and letting mom do your laundry for just a little bit longer. <laughs> I was one of those students as an undergrad who declared my major at the last possible moment before you would not be able to graduate in four years. Uh, so, and, and then I graduate and I didn't have a job. So if you don't have a job, you will. I feel very confident because you're from UNC. All right, I wanted to focus on a few things. One of the first things I wanted to talk about is the importance of trying something new. <laughs> Who in the most recent days has tried something new? What was something new you tried? Trying to learn how to program PHP. Oh, excellent. Will you teach me? Uh, if I learn it. Oh, okay. All right. Who else has learned something? I learned something about um, that turtles can breathe through their butts. <laughs> Mine is not that cool. Um, I did a mud run for the first time. Oh, how was a mud run? It was really hard. Is it hard? Yeah. Yeah. I got really bruised. Oh, bruised. Yeah. That can't be fun. <laughs> There's, uh, you know, you went to a, a school that's called a liberal arts school. You got a liberal arts education, and part of the reason we do that to you is not to make your life a living hell, although that is a benefit. <laughs> the primary thing is so that you can try new stuff. You come here with something in mind that you may want to do, or you're like me and you go to college and say, gee, what can I do? And you find something. And you glom onto that, and it's familiar, and it's great. And then we do rude things like gen ed, and make you take <laughs> classes in areas that you would rather run in busy traffic rather than go to. <laughs> Many of the 101-oriented courses, right? Particularly those that tend to meet at 8 o'clock in the morning, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. But there was a reason for that. There was a reason to go ahead and get you to think outside of where you had been and where you think you're going. Because it prepares you now. You know, we set up some gutters and stuff, but it prepares you now to try new things all the time. You know, you're going to live 152 years. So <laughs> you might as well experience everything as best you can, as soon as you can. So I was thinking about this from the perspective of, you know, we, we measure IQ, right? Um, who's in the School of Education? Is there an education person who can define IQ for me? <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> you don't want to define it? And it's child development. Child development. Well, it has, hopefully they have an IQ. <laughs> um, I think it has something to do with your capacity to learn. Right? So I was thinking about that, and I was thinking from this perspective of, well, that's really cool, but really there's, I would propose two categories, subcategories within that. The first one is your intellectual, oh, I forgot. These are things that I did not like to do. Um, four out of three people struggle with math, in case you can't read that. And the other one is the exam question is, give the, uh, given the right angle below, find x, and somebody has an arrow and points to it and says, here it is. That's me in math. But I was thinking about this. And we have your intellectual regurgitation quotient. 
Now, unless you decide to grow up and be a bird or a cow, it's not going to serve you really well outside of the school environment. Yes, you had classes that had that regurgitation element to it, right? You had a class where you had to memorize a whole bunch of stuff and throw up on a page what you knew. I see some nods. My, uh, my favorite experience with this in, uh, when I was an undergraduate, I majored it in history, which is the most fun degree you can get without any prospect for a job. <laughs> um, and I took a course in U.S. diplomacy. Okay. And the, one of the things that the instructor wanted us to do was memorize every Secretary of State for every President of the United States. Now I'm thankful for the fact that I was, and to give away my age, uh, this was when Jimmy Carter was President. So thank, but that was still 200 years worth of presidents. And there are some of these guys who went through secretaries of state like water through a sieve. <laughs> so you had all this stuff to memorize. And I remember on the exam day, got the test, turned it over, wrote them all down because I was panicked that I would forget, and then went back and answered the questions. And I can tell you now, there's, I can remember Henry Kissinger, and that's pretty much it. <laughs> So that regurgitation thing really did not serve me all that well. So I would say let's go with the intellectual curiosity quotient. What is it that trips your trigger? What is it that gets you going and wanting to do something? Wanting to learn something just because you can. I have some examples I want to give. There are a couple of students that I've had the honor of working with. Uh, Maggie is one of them. I've been working with her this semester. She took uh, ethics with me. She's an ethics class survivor. And um, <laughs> at the end of the semester, she asked me, would I be willing to work with her? She had an interesting project in mind. Maggie wants to be a fitness instructor and just got her uh, yoga certification this semester. Very excited about that. But she had something that was on her mind, and that was how is fitness perceived? How is fitness discussed in media? What images do we get? And she looked in magazines that she and her peers look at, and she talked to fellow students about what they were getting from these messages and found that fitness is really just the new skinny that a lot of the portrayals are, in order to be fit, you must meet that perfect bod image. And that was a little distressing. And what she took from this, this isn't something she needed to do, but what she has taken from this is, when she goes out and teaches fitness, she has in the back of her mind and, and an understanding of how I need to bring that concept forward to my clients. How can fitness be something other than uh, you have to lose some of this that I have? Sorry. Um, an another example, Margaret is, uh, has decided that she is going to spend the summer after graduation riding her bike 4,400 miles. I say go with God, but you know, um, I'm sorry, I can't go with you. I'm a confirmed couch potato, and you know, 4.4 miles would be probably a little more than I could handle. But she decided to do this so that she has an opportunity to talk with kids, young adults, who have journeyed with cancer and who have been served by the Ullman Fund. And she wants to find out what their experiences are. It's a curiosity that drove her to this and a service element that has taken over in the process. Uh, we have students, uh, where's the group with Root? Where's the Root gang? I was just over there. Hi, guys. Helping to promote North Carolina products. Reese News Lab. We got any Reese News Lab people? They are looking at how media can be, uh, can catch up, change a business model, become profitable again. And it involves students across the university.
who are looking at this because they're curious. So I encourage you to focus on your, your curiosity quotient a lot more than you would on your uh, regurgitation ability. Because really, you go out in the real world, nobody wants you to memorize a whole bunch of stuff and blab it back at them. They want you to use it. They want you to advise them and share great detail. So keep that piece open. Keep the mind open. Now, in the spirit of trying new stuff, there's, there's a couple things that I want to do. First of all, I forgot to do this. I would like to thank Joanne Chirino. Did Joanne get here? Joanne Chirino gave me a tiara. <laughs> and I told her I would wear it, at least for a while. That was noisy. So. <laughs> it really grips your head, I gotta tell you. So what I wanted to do, and I'm not really sure how good the light is here, but we're going to try for the world's largest selfie. Now, I tried this in my ethics class, and it looks like I'm doing a photo bomb. <laughs> I'm not technically adept, but we're going to try this anyway. I want to see how many people we can get into the frame uh, and have a picture that I can remember all of you with. And apparently my hand is over it, so we can't do anything. Ooh, look, there you are. Um, and they made fun of me yesterday because, you know, I was trying to figure out how to push the button over here. And they said, you know, if you just flip the phone. Yeah, I feel like an idiot. I have a PhD. It's helping me a lot here. All right, so we are going to, to try this. Now, I looked up online, world's largest selfie, and I need Stephanie Brown to help me a little bit because I had trouble with this search. And what I got was some guy took a picture of 400 people taking selfies of themselves. I thought, damn, you can go to Pitt any day and get that. <laughs> so we're going to try the real selfie thing, OK? So there seems to be a little bit more lighting there. Anybody who wants to try to get into it, I'm going to just run down here and we'll see what we can do. Hang on. Ellen has nothing on us. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Um, which button am I supposed to push here? I know. It's really sad. OK. Camera. There it is. You got I got it now. Oh, you got it. I got it. Let's go. All right. So come on. All right. So how many can we get in here? That's what we're going to do. Hold it up. We're going to get everyone to come to you. There you go. Come on down. We got this. I got your back. All right. We got to wait. We need more. We need more. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Are you ready? One, two, three. All right. I think somebody blinked. Hang on, we have to see One more. Get my hand out of the way. Ready? All right. One, two, three. We did it! Woo! All right. Now there's one other thing I want you to do. You guys can queue up the... I think it's important that I also learn something new. So I have, I'm requesting somebody who is willing to teach me a new dance step. It doesn't involve twerking, because I do not want this to be my last lecture. <laughs> so do I have any volunteers? Anybody going to go take a chance? I'm a really uncoordinated human being. Somebody come. And we're going to do, you want to go ahead and start it? This is what we're going to, you're going to teach me to dance to. Except there's no sound. We can mime it. <laughs> Do 
just going to teach me. Come on. This is all you got to work with here. Oh my god! Somebody's got to help me out. <laughs> Yay! Oh, wait, what are you doing? Uh, here, we do some kids. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, here we go. Oh. <laughs> What else could I do? Thank you. That was fabulous. I am so uncoordinated. All right. What else was I going to talk about? Ask. Ask questions. Every chance you get, ask a question. Like, why did I just do that? <laughs> ask for information. Ask for advice. Ask for an explanation. And I think most importantly, ask for help. Trust the cancer patient here. It is the hardest thing in the world. Uh, it was a low point for me. And I had to ask for help. I'm a very independent person. And it was very, very challenging for me to admit I couldn't do everything by myself. I needed somebody to go with me to the grocery store because I couldn't lift the bag of litter. I needed people to take me to my chemo appointments. And it was hard, but, and I felt like a failure. But I will tell you this, the one thing I learned more than anything was people want you to ask. They want you to ask them for help. They want you to ask questions because it makes them feel good. You can be part of the answer. Here comes my ride. <laughs> if you were willing to ask. So ask those questions. 
and let people help you. Let us help you. Hopefully we did while you were in college. And we're still here, so come back and ask us questions. Or send us emails with questions. Ask us for advice. You know, it's one thing about professors, we will always have something to say. <laughs> Not all of it's useful, but we will always have something to say. You can get 10 faculty in a room and you get 15 different opinions. It's amazing. So ask. One other thing I want to remember about asking. People will ask you for stuff. And there's a good group that's going to ask you for stuff. I promise to put in the commercial for the General Alumni Association. Give to your school. Remember us. Remember us. Don't forget us. We get all weepy. They never call. They never write. <laughs> we need you. So remember. Remember what brought you here? Does anybody remember what it was like their first day on campus? What was, your, what was it like? Somebody tell me. What was your first day like? I got lost going from Stacy to my first class and got there 15 minutes late. Nice, yeah. The get there late thing. There's always that. Excuse me, pardon me, excuse me, pardon me, excuse me, pardon me, excuse me, pardon me. Daniel. It was completely different. Um, it was uh, exciting, but like I was scared at the same time. I didn't know what to expect. You know. Yeah. What do you expect? Anybody else have a really good, fun thing? I was a graduate student, came here, and I had gone to a very small school as an undergraduate. And I came here and I thought, oh my god, it's huge. But I will tell you, from 1995 when I started as a graduate student here, there was, has not been a day when I walk across campus that I don't see somebody I know. That's amazing. It's a family. Somebody else had one. The first day I was at Carolina, there weren't any clouds in the sky, and it was sunny, and the weather was perfect, and it was a good day to be a Tar Heel. Absolutely. <laughs> Woo! Tar Heel blue skies. So, you know, we're better than like Duke and State, right? Some of my students know my, my state joke, I call them Moo You. Do you know the difference between culture and agriculture? About 15 miles. <laughs> your, your remembrances, I know a lot of you where I've talked to some of you who said, you know, you're very excited about leaving and you don't want to leave at the same time because you have so many great memories here. Hold on to those. Come to homecoming. It will be November 14th through 16th. <laughs> you can go to homecoming.unc.edu. <laughs> Come to homecoming. Remember, stick with us. So, sort of where we are, try new stuff, ask questions, remember, and lo and behold, it's tar. Yeah. Tar. Eels! Tar! Eels! You still got it. <laughs> What's next? T-A-R-H. Uh, help people. I was having trouble with my alphabet. Never underestimate the difference you can make in the lives of others. Step forward, reach out, and help. This week, reach to someone that, and that should be who, because I teach grammar, <laughs> might need a lift. What I love about Carolina students is the fact that you like to help. The number, who's a, a public service scholar? How many folks? Good. And you're, you want to make a difference. That's what I love about this place is you want to help each other. You want to help your family. You want to help your community. These are the signs of great human beings. You are great human beings. Because you will help people. And that's what I love about you. I love you all. 
I teach ethics, so I have to do this. Talk about ethics. Expect ethical challenges. People are going to challenge your sensibilities. You have values. I feel very confident about that. You have beliefs, a very strong core of values that your family gave you, that you have grown over a period of time. And I guarantee you there will be people who ask you to violate those values that you hold dear. They may not think it's that big of a deal, but you will. And sometimes the people who are going to ask that question for you to violate your standards are going to be the people who are in power, your boss. Do this, and you think, should I do that? Think about it as far as knowing it's going to happen, and how will you respond? Where is that line that you're not going to cross? And sort of think about that ahead of time. When you're looking at jobs, check out their code of ethics. What are their expectations? Do they meet what you believe is most important? OK, that's enough of this scary stuff. Where's the, there we go. Embrace failure. It's odd to have a professor to tell you to go out and fail. Because since kindergarten, you have been told not to fail. And you have GPAs that show that you do not frequently fail, except maybe one of those gen ed classes in your first semester. <laughs> Michael Jordan is quoted as saying, I failed over and over, and that is why I succeed. He bombed out in high school basketball. He bombed out in high school basketball. And after he finished his stellar career, here and in the pros, he tried out for baseball. He never made it out of double A. He failed. But think of the number of inventions and solutions that have come out of people failing. There's a wonderful saying that says, if you fall down seven times, get up eight. That's what you need to do. If you're going to fail, fail boldly. I know there are people who are here uh, who were in my class the time I fell off a table in class. <laughs> and I told them if they had skipped that day, they would have missed me falling on my butt. <laughs> Go ahead and fail. Do not be afraid to fail, because that's where solutions come from. If you've ever participated in a brainstorming session, it's all designed to throw out a whole bunch of wild and wacky ideas. Who knows if they would work? That's not the point. The point is to think about it, because that idea may lead to something else. And that failure may be the spark that gets you to the solution. So fail boldly. Embrace it. Do hard things. <laughs> do something that should be something you shouldn't be able to do. A little wiener dog <laughs> taking on a very large branch. <laughs> Ain't he cute? Is Ollie still here? He's in the back. Ollie is the journalism school mascot. If you go to the school's website under faculty and staff directory, he has his own page. Live, live, love, laugh, laugh, laugh a lot. That's Ari Heyer. She graduated in December. She probably could have taught me to dance. Um, she's a lot, looks a lot better at it than I do. But be silly. Be yourselves. Be crazy. Don't take yourself too seriously. One of the things I counted on when I was going through treatment was that somebody could help me laugh. And I had to rely on myself, too, to find things to laugh at. Cancer is not funny. 
but there's a lot of funny stuff that happens. When my hair started falling out, I decided to go and just get it buzzed off. Well, there's one thing about when your hair falls out, it's not like the hairs go ready, set, go, and they all leave. So even if you get your head shaved, you're still gonna have those little things that continue to fall out. And it's sort of like a perpetual haircut because you've always got this stuff going on. And one day, I, uh, I was actually cleaning, which is, ew. Um, <laughs> come look at my office, you'll understand. Uh, and I was, uh, my, I, Sophie the Wonder Cat was shedding profusely, and I was using a lint roller. And I thought, hey now. So I, <laughs> <laughs> It's my new product on marketing. <laughs> it really does pick up the hair right off your head. <laughs> uh, one of my colleagues who went uh, with me to chemo sometimes, we played Yahtzee a lot. And after uh, I had two different drugs I had to go through, I had a set of four treatments and then another set of four. And when they started me on the second drug, they said, some people have allergic reactions, so we're gonna wash you carefully. So they get about, you know, two inches from your face. And are you, are you okay, are you okay, okay? You know, it's like, yeah, if you would back off, I'd be a lot better. <laughs> so after about 30 minutes, they say, okay, well, you're probably not gonna fall over and die, so we're gonna go and do our other stuff. Well, we were playing Yahtzee, and Barbara threw a Yahtzee. And we got very excited, and we yelled. And a nurse came flying out of nowhere. <laughs> Is everything okay? We said, yes, she threw a Yahtzee. <laughs> so find, you know, find the humor even in those dark times. Even in those times you think, there's no way this can have any humor. There's no way I can pull myself up and go on again. You can, and you will. You will do it, you will have fun. You will find things like learning that <laughs> what Mount Rushmore looks like from the Canadian side. <laughs> I love it that somebody came up with this. It's amazing. Now I want to go to the Canadian side and see. What kind of old person are you going to be? You know, they say after 50, you don't have to grow up anymore, so thank God I've passed that. Um, I, I no longer have to worry about that. Um, I, uh, and, and just to take a moment, I, I turned 55 yesterday. So you can live at least this long. It will work. Have some fun. If you take that test, it tells you what kind of old person you'll be. There are so many fun tests online. I waste a lot of time. Oh, I shouldn't say that out loud. <laughs> Soar. Fly. Go. You can do anything. You will do everything. And I'm going to be able to sit back and go, oh yeah, I knew her when. I knew him when. I have their autograph because they signed the pledge. <laughs> You will, you will be incredible. You will soar, you will make us so proud. We're already proud. We could just wee wee in our pants. <laughs> with pride. Another aspect of soar I found, show respect, own your actions, accept differences, realize your potential. That is what it is to soar. You, will soar. You're going to kick butt. You already kicked my butt. All right, one, one little exercise here before we wrap up. What word would you use to describe yourself? I've been thinking about this. I'm not really sure what my word would be yet. Who's got a word? How would you describe yourself? This will be on the test. Oh, no, it won't. I'm sorry, wrong lecture. <laughs> oh, 
why is it that every time something goes backwards, it has to be? <laughs> when they were doing construction near my building, uh, in Carroll Hall, I feel like they did construction entirely in reverse. <laughs> Do you have a word for yourself? Anybody got a word they want to share with themselves? They don't want to admit it. What would be my word? Oh, here's a word. Cynthia's got a word. Curious. Yeah! I didn't even pay her to say that. <laughs> That's this sort of elevator speech approach to life. But think of who you are, and who you want to be, and how you're going to be who you're going to be. Soar. Don't let the bastards wear you down. I'm going to get in trouble for my language. I think I have something else here, I'm not sure. Oh, you rock. <laughs> I always wanted to do that. <laughs> I am so proud of you. I am so grateful to all of you for being part of Carolina, for being part of my life. Because see, I sort of stay here and you guys come and go on me. It's very distressing. <laughs> but I, I am touched by every one of you. You, <laughs> this is scary, you have made me who I am. <laughs> it's your fault. <laughs> And I am so proud, and I'm so proud of this day. I'm so proud of where you're going to be and who you're going to be. And I hope you will stay in touch. Thank you. God bless.